Well, thanks for staying with us. Apologies for that. Now, as we were saying, the surge in petrol price from uh, 2022 to 2023 did cause out, uh, you know, outbreak of chaos and anger. Imagine, you know, buying petrol for about 200 naira per litre as of 2022 and then having to buy for like triple the price in 2023. So you can imagine what the frustration will be, what the surprise will be. Hearing the World Bank say that um, the price should actually be 750 naira as opposed to the 650 um, that is currently being sold. And, uh, you know, that brings the question, what exactly should the government do with that information, bearing in mind the effect that it has had on our economy and the fact that Nigeria as a whole has a staggering economy. So should we compare it to other countries? Should we compare, um, you know, the, the total alleviation of uh, subsidy or should we at least just manage what we have? Anyways, um, joining us to have this conversation, we did introduce him earlier, but for the sake of those who hadn't joined in then, uh, we'll now be joined by Dr. Muda Yusuf, a director, Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise in Nigeria. Dr. Yusuf, thanks again for joining us. Thank you very much, Bless. My pleasure. Okay. Now, uh, Dr. Yusuf, you, got, uh, you heard the information about the World Bank saying that the actual price of petrol should be 750 naira as opposed to the 650 or about 650 that it's been sold because then uh, and only then is when uh, the federal government can actually um, get the, I mean, achieve their aim of saving up some money and taking out completely fuel subsidy. What do you think about that? Well, uh, I think the World Bank was uh, speaking purely from an economic point of view. But economic management is not just about economics. It's also about the social aspects of economic management. It's about also giving economic policies or economic reforms in human face. So the World Bank was not reckoning with the social implications of uh, the kind of recommendations that they were making. But it's for those who are in government to take into account the social dimensions of policy. Because just as you said in your intro, uh, the poverty situation now is extremely very bad. Uh, the social environment is very tense. Uh, the citizens are looking up to government on how uh, the government can give them some relief, you know, uh, as a result of some of these current economic policies. Uh, the policies were necessary, no doubt, but the social consequences of the policies have been very, very severe. They have been very, very profound on the welfare of the citizens. So it is just an advisory thing. I don't think the government is bound to take it. Government should show more commitment to the welfare of the people, to the social dimension of economic management. I think that is what should be. So, but do you think the World Bank is aware of the effect that, that this has had on Nigerian citizens? Well, from what they have said, I'm not sure they are aware. What they have said is purely a technical proposition. It's a technical perspective as to what should happen in an ideal situation. But just as we often say, whatever economic policies we are adopting, we have a responsibility to localize those policies, to put those policies within the context of the environment in which we are operating. So we situate it within the current context, especially the current social context, the current context of aggravating poverty then this kind of proposal cannot fly at all. So this, the, the, the World Bank uh, obviously has not reckoned with, you know, the welfare implications of uh, the kind of recommendations that they were making. And it wasn't even only that. They were also recommending that we should, uh, you know, tighten monetary policy. They were saying that we should remove trade barriers and all of them. All these things are not policy that can work right now. Because if you just open your, your, your borders and all of that, and all manners of things are coming in, how will the industry survive? Already we have a lot of uh, controversy around the 43 items that the CBN removed from the foreign exchange exclusion list. 
You know, we have complaints from businesses already about high interest rates. Interest rates now is around 30% or more. For SMEs, it's even over 30%. So when you're asking the, uh, more, the government or the monetary authority to further tighten interest rates, you want to push interest rate to 35 or 40%? How will businesses survive? How are they going to grow investments? How are you going to create, create jobs? So we need to we need to scrutinize all these recommendations properly and isolate those ones that can work for us and those ones that cannot work for us. Right. Now, uh, hypothetically speaking, right, in a situation where we had a better economy and um, this proposal was made, what impact would it have if, say, the country can increase the fuel price to 750 naira? Is it going to help us save more money or reduce uh, the level of pover uh, poverty? Remember, we're just being hypothetical. Say we had a better economy, everyone was living fine. What would this do for the economy? No, it will help in better allocation of resources. It will improve government revenue. It will remove the risk of smuggling of the petroleum products to other, other jurisdictions, especially the neighboring countries. And it will, of course, encourage more investments. And those who are in the business, of course, will make more money. So from that point of view, it makes sense. That is if you are in a this situation where the populace are not heavily dependent on road transportation, where the public have alternative means of transportation, where there are rail systems, where there is public transportation that is subsidized. If you come up with that proposal within that context, of course, it will not be a bad idea. It is to improve the efficiency of resource allocation within the economy. But here we are, we are grappling with a whole lot of issues, heavy poverty, inflation almost closing, uh, almost close to 30%. And we know the, 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 the impact of energy costs on inflation. We know what the poverty situation is. So in an ideal situation, fine. But are we in an ideal situation where we can absorb this kind of policy? Certainly not. All right. Um, now, this is a question that I, I um, always like to ask. Is there a viable alternative to petrol that could alleviate the financial burden on co consumers as well as on the government of the country? So the government is already talking about alternatives. I will have uh, this uh, CNG alternatives. We have been talking about renewable energy. Then more importantly, if we're able to improve the general power situation, where will people be depending so much on petrol? If we're able to improve our rail system, you know, where will people be depending so much on petrol? Where will this, where will so many people be putting their cars on the roads? Those are alternatives that can reduce the demand for, for petrol and for diesel and others. But we are still very far from that. You know, if you have a much better power situation, for instance, all the SMEs and individuals that are depending on petrol to power their, their, their factories or their businesses or their homes because there is no power supply, that demand will be off. I mean, people feel more comfortable using electricity than using generators. If you have more effective rail system, all this problem of people traveling by road right now, Close to 95% of movement within the country is, is by road. And these are things that are dependent on either PMS or diesel. So if, 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 if you increase that, you, you can imagine the, the multiplier effects in a negative sense that this will have all through. So those are alternatives. If the environment is better, if public transportation is better, if you have more alternative energy solutions, if we're able to do more renewable and we have fiscal policies to encourage more people to move into renewables, if you have you know uh, more, I mean, faster transition into the CNG that the government has been talking about, so that we use gas in instead of uh, PMS or diesel, those are those are viable options. Those are things that can make it easier for this kind of reform proposition to fly. But until we get there. You need to manage the situation at its, at it is, because the citizens cannot bear any additional burden of uh, increases in energy costs. Right um, now, 
I would also like for us to consider the current pricing uh, of petrol. We do understand that the government might not heed the advice of the World Bank, but even at that, the current price of petrol is still something to worry about. Now, looking at the current uh, economy and the pricing of petrol, are there any potential long-term consequences if nothing is done, either to reduce the pricing or increase um, the standard of living for the people? No, of course, the consequences are already here. I mean, look at many people have parked their cars. Look at the cost of transportation. Look at the pass-through or the knock-on effect of high energy costs on inflation, on the cost of food, on the cost of medication, on the cost of transportation, and generally the impact on inflation. Inflation now is, is getting close to, it's already above 20, 27%. Food inflation is over 30%. You know, a good component of that is arising from the fact that we have high energy costs. These are consequences. The consequences are already here. So what we can look up to is that first, if the government is able to accelerate, you know, the process of refining these petroleum products locally, in conjunction with what the private sector is doing, especially the Dangote refinery, if we're able to move faster than that, then the import dependence and import dependent nature of our of our economy on you know uh, energy will reduce because the cost of energy is this high because we are importing it. There's the global uh, issue around Ukraine and Russia which has pushed up energy prices. Then there is the exchange rate factor. So these two factors is what is causing this very high. I you know high cost of energy. So if we're able to, you know, refine locally, and luckily we are getting some good news from Dangote, and the government has also promised that by December or January, some of our refineries, government only finance will begin to work. That is part of the solution. That will be a major step towards solving this problem. And if in the medium term we see some, you know, a lowering of of tempo in the war between Ukraine and Russia, globally energy prices can also come down. If that happens, the prices will also come down from the import perspective. But the, the low hanging fruit for us now is to ensure that we accelerate the process of refining the petroleum products domestically so that we can shield the economy from the shocks of exchange rates and from the shocks of global oil price. All right, uh, Dr. Muda Yusuf, Director, Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise in Nigeria. Thank you so much for joining us. And we really do hope that a solution is brought forth um, to the petrol pricing and, of course, the standard of living for the people as well. Thank you once again for joining us on the show. Thank you very much, Blessed. Thank you. My pleasure.